that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide <laughs> under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. He shall deliver thee from the snake. forsake you. I'll be with you. You're coming in. I'll be with you. You're going out. I'll be with you in the city and in the field. He lets me down. I slept. I awakened. The Lord sustained me. Therefore I shall not be afraid of 10,000 people that rise up against me. Amen. This morning I'd like to share with you from Luke 16. Mama read the whole lot of scripture on it. And while you're looking for Luke 16, one verse of scripture, which I want to read again, verse number 22. Uh, topic of my sermon, life after life. And while you're doing that, let me tell you something which you don't know but which is true last night you died you don't know because you were so deeply asleep you don't know what happened but all of the forces of hell and all those who don't want you to have a life or, or be successful here they gathered themselves just a conglomerate of evil they came over your life and they killed you. Then God spoke to an angel and said, take more life and go and give her because she's useful to me. It's a good place to clap. <laughs> Tabitha You can't stop her from dying. But you can't stop her from coming alive again. Amen. But if you have been there where you actually saw death and came back. My point is every good thing you do for God and for other people, they give you a right to be here. Because God loves people and he wants to help them. And it's only people who will help God help others that he finds a good reason for them to remain on this planet. Can you say a big amen to that? Amen. The fact that you woke up this morning and saw another day, it's a sign that no force in heaven or earth can stop you. God is on your side. When you are sleeping, you knew nothing about you. The mercy and the grace of God gave you another day. So you can say, this is the day the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. God knows you. He cares about you. He is fighting for you. You are not alone. He said, I would never leave nor forsake you. So remember that whatever you're going through or have been through lately that looks so negative, God allowed them to pass through because you are useful to him. Because one day you will put your hand on another sister or another brother and you say, calm down. Don't give up. If you hear my own story. So God gave you a story 
so you can lift up somebody up in future you say i once was down but god lifted me up i was once a reproach but god has made me a pride of, uh, among my own people i was a voice that could not be heard but see what the lord has done so don't complain about what you go through because it's not for you you are destined for breakthrough you are destined for success your twins will be celebrated on this planet your new house will be dedicated in this world your car will come all you are looking for They're very simple and very easy for God. He has given to people who didn't ask him. How much more are you? He has given to people who don't believe in him. He allowed them to, give, to have it. They just worked hard and he blessed their labor. How much more are you? Don't you know if God don't want them to have anything, they can't have it. So God has not forgotten you. He told me to tell you that he loves you. And you should be confident. Don't feel intimidated when you are around people who have or who are, who are what you are not. Walk with confidence. Why? Because you know what they don't know. What is it you know that they don't know? You know that your Redeemer live it. You know that he that watches over Judah and Jerusalem does not sleep nor slumber. You know in whom you have believed and you are persuaded that is able to keep that which you promise at the end of the day. Hallelujah. So look at your neighbor and say, I look forward to hearing your story. Put your hand on your chest and say, I will inspire many people. Say, because of me. Many will have hope. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say the Lord is good. Who is the person that's going through pain right now? I'm not talking about trouble pain, but there's pain on your body. I can feel your pain. Come, 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 come. Hold this for me. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, heal your daughter right now from all of this. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, wherever it is, I rebuke this pain and I command God's perfect health over you. In the name of Jesus, the Lord heals eyes. Mm, be healed. Be healed of this pain. In the name of Jesus, be healed and made whole in the name of jesus i rebuke this pain and i command you to be healed and made whole in the name of jesus the lord jesus heals you right now right now in the name of jesus i, I just had someone who prayed you said god i'm tired of spending money on my mother your mother has been going in and out and in and out of sickness. Every morning you want to do something with, sickness comes. The Lord will bring a solution. Come to me. In the mighty name of Jesus. Is that you, my dear? You're trying to make ends meet and you're struggling. With everything you have for mom. This thief of your wealth and your life. I rebuke it. This devourer, I rebuke it. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I release you to financial obedience. From today, your tithe, you must give them. Your promise to God, you must give them. And then God will take care of stuff and your resources will no more be a waste. Ah, we would like to spend our money on mom. But not money sustaining her or giving, giving it to the doctor. Money to give her nice clothes. Money to give her nice food. I pray that God does it for you. All of you kneeling down here. May almighty God prevail. Save your finances. 
that you may use it to serve God in the mighty name of Jesus. Return to your seat. The mighty name of Jesus. Kambura Deba Shandeyada. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead. Let's give God a big hand. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Life after life. In Luke 16, 22, we read this scripture. And it came to pass that the beggar died. Now, this would not make front news. Poor beggars, no food to eat, are supposed to die. The beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. Now, this is front page news. And was buried. Now, note, God knows your status. He knows who is rich. He knows who is not rich. He knows who is a beggar and he knows who is not. Let me just draw your attention to the fact that Number one, this is a true story. It's not a parable. If it's a parable, he will tell us. If it's a parable, he will interpret the parable for us and tell us what it means. But when you read this text, Jesus is the one talking. And he said there was a certain man. When he was talking about Lazarus and the rich man, he was certain that there was a man. This is history. This is a true story. There was a man. One of them even had a name. Lazarus. Not just behold. If a man cometh who is poor. And a man cometh who is rich. No, no, no. There was a man. Question on my mind. Why did he mention one of the names. And not the other. Because he knows everybody. In the world that we live in, Pastor Abel, it is only the rich man's name would have known. Poor people don't get mentioned in public gatherings. It is only rich. But when Jesus was talking about both of them, there was a certain man called Lazarus. Another one, he was rich. Described by what he had, not who he is. Why did Jesus not mention his name? Because that name was not in heaven's book. I know about you, but I know you not. When your name is written in the book of life, then the God of life mentions your name often. He was saying... As much as he was very important in this world, his name is not important. He has no name in heaven. Rich, physically, but totally bankrupt spiritually. But Lazarus' name was precious in the mouth of the Messiah. Though he was poor, poor physically, he was rich in God. So his name was mentioned. He said the rich man also died and was what? Buried. Now this is where our picture of life comes to an end. When people put you in the coffin and bury you. Hide you under the ground where they can't see you. That's when we weep, we cry, and we say it's over. But note verse 23. Verse 22 says buried. Go back to 22. It says buried. Notice the semicolon there. And then 23 says and. He's still talking. Buried and. In hell. He lifted up his eyes. Being in torment. And seeth Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. How can a person who's been buried lift up his eyes? Ladies and gentlemen, I, I submit to you this morning that dead people are always pretending. 
people gather. <laughs> All I mean. And this rich man, they have an ordinary wedding. I mean, ordinary burial. You know, they talk about society wedding. The society funeral too. Come and see the casket. See the kind of poor hired because the poor in the family are not enough to carry the casket. So they get people with uniform carrying casket and doing some stuff. Bands playing. Everything was exotic. And then they put him in the coffin and then they bury him. That's when both the people who really cared for him and those who are pretty just pretending began to cry. Oh, chief, chief. Some of the tears are out of guilt. Some are out of culture and tradition. You know, we hire criers too. People do that. So they say people really cried. <laughs> I watch a movie <laughs> and they thought a man died. They put this body in a coffin and buried it, uh, you know. And uh, it was a big man, so the funeral was on TV. And the guy was somewhere else seeing his own funeral. To cut the story short, when he came back, he said, So that's the best you can do for me in my funeral. He was angry for the kind of funeral they had for him. So somebody said, sorry, brother, but next time, we do better. <laughs> and I'll give you another story. Um, somebody lost a member of his family, and then he went to this guy who makes coffins. And nice coffins seemed too expensive. So he kept not talking, what's, what's up? At least... What do you put? I try you put happy when people die. He said, no, 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 no. We just try to make a living and so on. He said, look, reduce this thing for me. After a while, the man said, look, just pay this money. The next two times you come, I will give you a discount. <laughs> that guy started beating him. Now you go do two times. Idiot. They pray, say, <laughs> my relatives die. <laughs> But you know, when Jesus told the story, I believe that he was trying to communicate a very important message. That just when you think a person's life is finished, another life begins. So look at this rich man. He's closed his eyes. He's not breathing. That's what dead people do. They put in a coffin, bury you. When they've gone, then you open your eyes. And you're able to see far off and see Father Abraham and see the Lazaruses of this world. There's more life when this life ends. Also, Jesus tried to pass across to us that how your next life will be will depend on how your present life was. So, in a great way, this is also a story of consequences. Remember, story of two men, they all died. No one escaped death. They all died. And Bible now shows us the consequences of their life on earth. One rose up, lifted up his eyes in hell. Get up and say to four people, hell is real. It's not a parable. Then get up and say to four people again, so is heaven. Now look for three people and tell them, I will not die now, but if I die, don't be deceived. I'm still alive. (laughs) 
<laughs> Mama, we learned from Jesus that being a righteous Lazarus does not keep you from dying. We learn from Jesus. Having a lot of money and being richer than everybody cannot keep you from dying. I always say that in my own mind, in my own personal philosophy, there are two denominators. Two things that bring all of us to the same level. One is death. Okay, one any. The rich die also. The poor die. The beautiful die. The ugly die. No matter what kind of hair you are wearing. No matter what kind of designer's clothes. Uh, um, who are you wearing? I'm wearing a uh, Vasakutu Katakataba, but I'm also somewhere wearing death. Jesus taught us that when we live this life, there's another life where accountability is demanded. Where the consequence of what we did with this life shows up there. Whether it's reward or the opposite. Remember when uh, uh, this man turned to Father Abraham. Father Abraham, I'm tormented in this place. Please help me. And then they spoke. He said, send Lazarus. All over that scripture, he kept on telling them to send Lazarus. Because his picture of Lazarus is still that beggarly house boy, boy, who is so, so much lower than him. Send Lazarus. Lazarus, Lazarus just cool it here for heaven's sake. This guy don't know that they different level. Now me go send you now. <laughs> Somebody say hallelujah. But if you read verse number 25 of the same Luke 16, he said, oh yes, you had a great life, Mr. Richman, and things weren't that good for Lazarus. But because he knows God, because he has a life with God, now he is comforted, but thou art tormented. That means, Pastor Samson, when this life is over and the coffin is closed, in the other life, we will either be comforted or be tormented. Get up and ask four people who you didn't ask before. Will you be comforted or you'll be tormented? And you answer by the grace of God, I will be comforted. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Why will Bishop Fred Ado be talking about life, I mean about death and the other life on Valentine's Day? Well, first you all know that I'm not a fan of Valentine's. Somebody called me and we're talking. He said, oh, so how will church be tomorrow? I said, yeah, church will be great. He said, so do you have any special Valentine plan for the church? I said, no, uh, uh, it's not a public holiday in our country. And it's not in our church calendar. And there's nothing in the word of God that says, do this in remembrance of me. <laughs> <laughs> have thou that valentine now don't get me wrong love is a good thing i'm happy people can can express love at least once a year that's the level they operate i've always told you i don't like once a year love and if you only tell me you love me because there's valentine it means nothing because i know you're telling everybody you love them general love no be love hello when I woke up this morning and I was praying, preparing for this message, I sent my wife a text, a very deliberate text. I thought about her, her value, and I expressed love to her. And at the end, I told her I don't believe in Valentine, 
but I wish you a happy fredding time. I don't know that guy, whether he's a demon. I can't go and wish happy Valentine on my wife for wrong thing enter her. I wish her a happy Friday time. For the rest of you, I'm sorry I can't wish you a happy Friday time, but at least I can wish you a happy Jesus time. <laughs> Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> Why am I talking about death? Because if you have no life, you can't love or be loved. And I hope you know, like the, the, the drama we saw from the youth factory, a perverted person can only give you perverted love. If a person is not faithful to God, how can they be faithful to you? A whole God. They don't have respect for God. Why would they have respect for you? And I beg to disagree a bit with the youth leader. Love always involves giving. For God so loved that he gave. Love always involves giving. But there's no way it says love involves demanding. People think of, what are you going to give me this Valentine? Like that uh, skeleton girl was saying. Say, honey, honey, Valentine is coming. What are you going to give to me? You might ask her, what are you going to give to me? If a guy has not paid his rent and he has to buy you a stupid phone which you don't even know how to keep, then you are an enemy. I didn't buy my wife anything for Valentine. Because three days ago and four days ago before that three days in our house love happens every time. Giving happens every time. Every time something good happens to me where well, I just sit down and I think about my wife or my kids and wonderful things how they've been to me. I find something small. Give them. I love you. So to us, Valentine. It's just a propaganda. Now, every day, we don't get time for all those things. Those of you who, anybody can buy your love one day in a year. Sorry for you. Anyway, in case you are very interested in, in the Valentine sermon, I'll give you one scripture, John 3, 16. Because you can't do love without your God, your God love. For God so loved what? The world that what? He gave his only begotten son. Who is his only begotten son? Jesus. Now note, he didn't say he gave up his only begotten son. Even though he did, he gave. So the gift God gives when he loves anybody in the world is Jesus. So if you want to show real Valentine, if you love someone today, Give them Jesus. If I want to fix that a little deeper for you, I would say the Bible tells us who Jesus is, Abel. He is the power of God. He is the wisdom of God. So, he's, he's God's love. His love. So, if you want to give, if you love somebody, give them forgiveness. Give them hope. Give them wise advice. Wherever you go today, give someone Jesus. Everything he represents. Give them sacrifice. Give them care. Give them forgiveness. That's who Jesus is. When I was reading this scripture, trying to get ready for the service, I was like, ah, Jesus, this is one of those days I like one of my favorite topics about love. So even Jesus, you know, we don't like to talk about death. It's not a great topic. Only comes up on funeral day. But, but I reckon that whatever Jesus is willing to talk about, we should be willing to talk about it. And when you study this scripture, Mama started to read from verse 19. Verse 18, I asked myself, what was going on? That Jesus started threatening them about everybody dying and some going to heaven and hell. He was actually teaching about marriage. So this was a marriage seminar. Love, marriage, divorce. That's what he was talking about in verse 18. 
And then he suddenly switched and started talking about death and the other life. Why? Well, because life and death are two sides of one coin. Death is a part of life. We may want to live in denial and not want to face it. We hate to talk about it, but we know it happens. It's a part of life. I think time has come for you to start to live with the consciousness of that reality. I don't mean wake up one day and say, ah, I may die today. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. But while you're planning your life, know that part of that plan includes death. The word of God, Hebrew 9, 27, says it is appointed unto men once to die and after that judgment. It is appointed. It is an appointment. Hello? I know that Africans, they say, are always late for appointments. But it seems that when it becomes... When it comes to the area of death, we are earlier than most people. Our mortality rate is very high. We just seem to come on time, if not before time. Let me read you the message version of that Hebrew 9.27. Everyone has to die once, everyone. Then face the consequences. And the rich man died also that's why you need to consider your life as a privilege like i always say many died in their sleep last night all kinds of people die poor beggars die rich people die old people die young people die beautiful people die but for you the word of god in psalm 91 says with long life Will I satisfy you? If you believe for a long life, say amen. amen. So I prophesy on you that you're going to see your children's children. Amen. But remember that when you are able to say, I shall not die, but live to declare the word of God. Remember that I shall not die does not mean I will never die. Long life is yours. But the question is, how long is long, Seth? What they were talking, and Mama said, ah, can you imagine, Dan is already 25. I said, you want to buy him, wife? Think about the last time you remember your age. When I was getting to being 40, I was afraid that that is too old. I slept, woke up, and I was already 50. I'm 53 years old now, only. The only consolation I get is that most people around me, all these men of God, they're all older than me. So it makes me feel young. Now, I'm afraid of 6 zero. I know it's almost 7 or 6 years more, but it's closer than we think. How long is long? We want to read 90 years? How old is your mother? Uh, grandma, please stand. This is how beautiful an 80 years old woman looks like. Hallelujah. Would you stand with her? Uh, help her turn so much that they can see her. They say if you want to marry her, check your mother out first. Uh -huh. This is how mama will look when she's 80 years. <laughs> See the smile. Man. Uh, full option. <laughs> Sit down, mommy. 80 years! Eighty years comes very quickly. You have little children. Ah, baby. Nye, 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 nye. Before you know, ah, ah. See this girl. Who? You don't talk. How old are you now? I'm 21. Ah, ah. Don't 
don't you wonder about your age something that ah, now well, small small my age is going when it comes to your age there's an accelerator there's gear seven James 4 and verse number 14. Best way to describe what I'm saying. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? Good question. What is your life? Is your life Brazilian here? A platform, high, tall shoes? Is that your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time then vanishes away. Not that word little time. What you think is so much is so little. I advise spend your little time wisely. Life is more than money. Life is more than shoes. Life is more than clothes life is more than how you look like the, the preacher says vanity upon vanity all is vanity don't get me wrong i'm not telling you to take a vow of poverty i love good things don't i look good but i n always remember remind myself that the thing where they wear or not tell they wear you what you put on has no relevance to the value of your life. Value of your shoe is not your value. Everything I have. You know, I made a habit. When people buy something for me, especially if it's expensive, or I buy it. In my mind, I say, God, I better borrow me, make a shine small. It's borrowed. It's nice. But it's borrowed. There's a trouble that could come. You will sell all this thing one day, even for the grace of God. But that is not your portion. Amen. But don't let these things get a hold of you. You have too much little time to live your life doing nothing but makeup. And nothing wrong with makeup. But don't leave this world and the Lord said, How did she spend her life? She spent most of her time doing makeup. And buying clothes. She didn't have time to appreciate her mother who suffered for her. As soon as she got money, she thought of that shoe, that cloth, that whatever. She was too busy with herself. And didn't make any impact in anybody's life. Look at the living Bible of James 4.14. How do you know what is going to happen tomorrow? For the length of your life is as uncertain as the morning fog now you see it soon it is gone have you had people very close to you who say and i was with him yesterday that's how uncertain this life can be don't get me wrong i'm not saying you're going to die any minute from now i'm not guaranteeing you that you won't i want you to be here for as long as possible. Because God said long life. Will I satisfy you. But when you read the word of God. You will find out. That a man's righteousness. Cannot stop. His transition to the next life. And the death. In the life of a man. Does not indicate his spirituality. Or the lack of it. Or else Jesus will still be here. They were stoning Stephen. Such, such an unkind kind of death. Somebody said to me, what is even paying me that the death was so bad we can't even find my mother's bones to bury. I said, that's because your mother doesn't need the bones. As soon as a person passes out to that place where they open eyes, Either in hell or in heaven. Go ahead and decorate. You know there are people who will not give you nice clothes. They leave mama. If you see their mama anyhow. 
Because she's old, she looks tattered every time. But when mama now dies, or papa dies, come and see the designer's lace they will put around him. That's what my father used to tell us. He said, you see those food? They are celebrating their father's death. Come and see all the cows and all the animals. He said, all of you, if you have cow to give me, better give me now. If you don't give me cow and I die, you kill cow. I will come and slap all of you. <laughs> Carry all of you with me so I know how life is like. My dad wandered, so we didn't play with his cows before he died. Message version. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. So while you're making plans, remember, your life is not in your hands. While you're busy planning to achieve, don't forget to live. Because it's the life you live that matters after life. Not the things you get. You are nothing but a wisp of fog. Message, if not, cause humor. Back to sender. You are no, nothing but a wisp of fog catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Ah! How can a girl that beautiful disappear? No matter what you are wearing this morning, one day you will disappear. How many people have we known? Some of them, we know where they used to sit. Disappear. We grew up with somebody. Disappear. That, and she was so good. Disappear. She was wicked. Disappear. Here's my point. That little time the scripture speaks about is fast disappearing. So calm down your catwalk. Calm down. You're feeling good and rich. Or more educated than everybody else. And use your life as an opportunity. Why is your life an opportunity? Because there's an appointment. There's an appointment. So before that appointment comes, use that window of opportunity to do the right thing. Use the time, the little time you have before appointment with death to please God. If you want to be a good mother, be a good mother now. You want to be a good child, be a good child now. You know, all of my 53 years in the world, for which about 36 or more years I've used as a preacher. I've gone through many things in my life. Some of them self-inflicted. I've been rejected, disowned, insulted, abused, scandalized, ostracized. I felt the pain of need of enforced poverty. But I'm telling you, I've seen pain in ministry. Track distance. Because I had no other means to get there. And I've already committed myself. And told everybody God called me so I can't come back. My dad actually advised me. He said, since you refuse to do what I wanted to do. And you say God is the one that called you. And you're going to be a pastor. I have no problem with that. You're welcome home anytime you want to visit. But don't ever ask me for money. Since God has employed you, I hope he pays you. Uh, since I was a man of the word, I said, Dad, that's a deal. I accept it. Hallelujah. The Bible says God has pleasure in the prosperity uh, of his servant. Uh, the Bible says my God uh, shall supply all my needs uh, according to his riches and glory. Hey, my God. God brings water out of the rock. My God, my God, he feeds his servant by a widow that has the last food. Unfortunately, those kind of widows are no more here. 
<laughs> if they never eat, they go give you cobble. <laughs> Pastor, welcome. Hey, welcome. You go sit down there, they go give you anything. Those widows don't finish. May God bring us more. <laughs> Those who have the courage to give their last so that their last will not be their end. But Abel, there's no pain that I have carried in this life and ministry as the pain of death. My most the part of ministry I don't like at all is funerals. When people you know or people who you know lost people that mean so much to them. What do you say when those tears come down? What do you say when those pain is so much in their heart? How do you handle it? I would like everybody to live long. But if Jesus was in my congregation, on his deathbed, if I say, thou shalt not die, he will say, I fought a good fight. I finished my own race. You know, it's not everybody who finished their race fought a good fight. Your race can finish before you start to remember you have to fight. Kwanamutu <laughs> Yakariba. I had a good friend of mine. He became my friend because God sent me to Den Gongola State to go and preach. And uh, he heard about what God was doing through me in his own area. So we became very good friends. He was supportive in the ministry. Many years after being good friends, he took a, 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 a decision which by principle I did not agree with. So I told him, I'm not with you on this. I don't stand for a decision like this. You are wrong. So he got angry, called me names. I got angry and walked away. And I cut off from him. And to make it worse, we were not only not talking to each other, he was luring everybody that I love in my ministry, all my pastors, to come join. What do I still do with Fred? I better leave there. Come join me. So every rebel in my church, you know, Ended up in just in his ministry. That made me hate him more. I'm sure you've never had me use the word hate before. <laughs> he said, Papa is so loving. Not me today, I started the journey long. You have to be determined to be like God and keep pressing. Sometimes you don't feel it, but you act it because that's what will give God glory. <laughs> I forgive you. I'm sorry for what I did. All your mind is saying, now you're supposed to say sorry, foolish, foolish girl. But you do the right thing. Action speaks loud. When you take the right step, it becomes a habit. They say, why do you forgive so easily? I said, it's not easy at all. I paid my price. I've made a habit of forgiving and forgetting. I was so bitter. They wouldn't even mention his name around me. And one day, that was not the first time I, I, I kept on, because love is what I'm called to do, God kept on telling me, go make peace with your brother. I said, but have you forgotten what he did? God said, I'm not saying you should go and join what he did. He said, I'm, I'm your friend, despite all the things you have been doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, children don't try this in exam that English is only for here I deliver you from accident despite what you've been doing wrong which I don't agree with I give you food though I don't like what you're doing I found out I was not angry because I think he was living in sin I was thinking about myself because if they say Abel is a very bad person he drives his wife away I don't want to be near him to be associated with his mess. Mm. That is why even Mary and Martha didn't want to go near their own brother's grave. Mm. It is smear. Mm. You now see friends start to, hey, I beg, that girl, I beg. 
I beg. <laughs> the Bible does say if somebody falls, mm. you who are strong, go and restore him while watching your back. Mm. You. So that he don't fall where he fell. Exactly. But he did say stay away. He didn't say, take this woman, cut her, don't you? Take her, stay away from me, don't bring her near her. I shall not come in contact with iniquity, for the Lord has made me holy. He said, come here. If many of us were Jesus, that woman who sinned plenty, forget about her hair, not even her oil, will near Jesus' feet. I mean, God began to teach me, why are you so self-righteous? Is it because they don't know your own? And maybe you may think your own is better. It's not too serious a sin. What is serious, son, is what I say is serious. I've asked you to live in the way that pleases me. Not please everybody. Righteousness is not politics. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, it is as serious as Killing somebody. Is that not what the Bible says? You're a murderer if you don't forgive. Nobody will ever accuse you of of murder. I'm talking about consequences of sin. Hating somebody will never take you to court. How much more to prison? Not in this world. But there are grave consequences spiritually here and otherwise. Because if you don't forgive, you shall not be forgiven. That's what the Bible says. So one day I was praying and God came to me very strong. Go and make peace with your brother and forgive him. Well, I, don't, I, I didn't mind making peace and forgiving him. But he should come. Come to my house. And beg me. That I said, okay, well, well, it's alright. You know? But for me to go. When God became so strong, I said to myself, look at me criticize somebody who did the wrong thing. And I'm disobeying God clearly. Not only his word, but him himself. He's speaking to me with a, a voice I can hear. I know it's God. I know it's the Holy Spirit. And I'm not going. Mm. And I'm criticizing somebody mm. who has done me wrong. So I picked my things. I was supposed to go preach in uh, Wakari, I remember. I had a crusade or something in Wakari. And I said, good thing. Let me leave a day before. Since it happened that night. I went first to Joss. Saw him. Opened the door and saw him. A smile fell on his face. I was surprised he was happy to see me. So I said, my brother, how are you? He said, fine. He said, I beg, why did you face him? Come, go hug, Joe. So we hugged and we sat down and I apologized to him for hating him and the things I've said about him which he does not even know. I said, let me make it clear. I'm still not in agreement with what you have done. And what you are still doing. But I'm in agreement with you. You're my brother. If you need me, I'll always be there for you. And I will stand for you. Pray with you. And I'll never put you down. So he hugged me. Tears started coming down his eyes. So we spoke and we prayed together. And I left him that day. I can't remember that day. Is a Wednesday or something. I can't remember. Anyway, from, from him straight, I went to Wukari to have my crusade. I think it's the next day or that day night after I finished preaching that someone told me, have you heard about your friend? I said, which one? He mentioned that. I said, okay, I was with him yesterday. I saw him. He said, he died. You were with him yesterday? He died yesterday evening. I said, I was with him yesterday evening, early evening. He said, then he must have died after you left him. Wow. Wow. I sat down and I thought, Suppose I refuse to forgive him. That's the worst thing that happened to you. Ah! You know the lesson I learned? If you have someone to forgive, forgive now. If you have someone to appreciate, appreciate them now. If you have something you want to do for God, start it now. Don't wait till everything goes well. He that observes the cloud. When they're asking for contributions, I don't have money. But you have money to buy a phone card. How can I just go and give 2000 
I mean, as a preacher, educate. I've always suffered to that. Say, ah, Papa, I cannot come and give you ordinary 5,000. You are bigger than that. I'm waiting for the day God to just do something. When I package one money eh, and come and give you. What is 5,000 times 100? 500,000. So if everybody in this church, not everybody, just 100 people, give me 5,000 every week. My salary will be half a million every week. So in one month, one month, I'll be a young Milo. <laughs> young Milonia. So can you see what 5,000 can do? What God has called you to do is to play your own 5,000 role. If you do your part, we all do our part. Nothing will be lost. Start now! You think God has called you to sing? Start to sing now. And I'm not talking about singing in your bathroom. If you can't, if you can't join the choir, just start singing. One guy came to me and said, uh, uh, Daddy, I have this music, whatever, but I don't have money to ask a cassette. I said, no, you don't need money. Take tape recorder. <laughs> Sing to it. Then make a few copies and give some people. Now, as funny as that is, that was my first recording, tape recorder, with my guitar. If you ask Pastor Edwin now, who I used to know long ago in school, Bishop Edwin, even when my new music came out, he said, Car, I still like that one that you did on <laughs> with your guitar, only you. Can you imagine that? They brought my instrument, but I still prefer the one guitar. Say, I really want to write a book, but where will I get money to print it? Write it! Maybe when you are gone, somebody will bring out a fire. And they will, even if your English is not good, they will correct them and make a blessing out of people. Don't wait till you pass and say, Car, I could have done many things for God I didn't know. What am I saying? Simply, make your life count. Put your prints in the sands of time. Your time is short. Your life is not yours. If you want to serve God, serve in the whole of your heart now. There's no tomorrow. So we say, I ought to do some things, you know, later on and on, dedicate the rest of my life to God. What rest of life do you know? The man said, tomorrow I will do this, tomorrow I will do that. God said, oh foolish person. For today, today, your soul will require of you. I don't know who is required, whether it's God or the devil. But he said, satanic beings have planned to kill you today. And because you have no plan for me today. You are planning for tomorrow. You will not even see that tomorrow to do it. This is the time to be faithful to God. This is the time to serve God in the church. This is the time to pay attention to your children and to treat them well. This is the time 